So our next presentation is boosting conflict management competency in your workplace. So how ancient vir virtues can be used to improve workplace behavior. And so it's Kelly Van Buskirk who's going to lead us through that and a little bit about Kelly. So since his admission to the New Brunswick Bar in 1993, Kelly has practiced extensively in the field of civil litigation, focusing primarily on labor, employment and human rights. He represents employers, employees, administrative tribunals and unions, and also serves as an arbitrator and mediator. He joined the partnership team at Lawson Creamer in 1996 after building a successful labor and employment practice in Fredericton. Kelly frequently teaches law courses and seminars and has written books, articles, and other materials related to the law. As an adjunct professor at UMB's Faculty of Business, Kelly has taught undergraduate and MBA courses. He also teaches trial practice at UNB's Faculty of Law and Labor and Employment Law at the Law Society of New Brunswick's Bar Admission Course. His articles have been published in the Canadian Labor and Employment Law Journal, the Canadian Mediation and Arbitration Journal, the Canadian Bar Review, the International Review of Human Rights Law, the Solicitor's Journal, Workplace Today Magazine, and other publications. Kelly was also a regular columnist on CBC's Business Network, a nationally broadcasted radio program, and has been frequently requested to provide legal commentary to the Globe and Mail, CTV News, CBC News, and other media. His book, Why Employees Sue, Rethinking Approaches to the Resolution of Employment Conflicts was published by Thomas Thompson Reuters in 2017. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Kelly. Welcome, bienvenue. Hi, thanks very much, Angela. And thanks um, everyone for joining in today. Um, I want to especially thank the organizing committee of the Respectful Workplace Week Conference I think uh, everyone online here today would agree that the material that's being uh, conveyed, at least up to this point, has been uh, really helpful. And, um, and we know that it takes a lot of work to put an event like this together. So I'm, uh, I'm thankful to the committee for organizing the event, also to you uh, for taking an interest in the subject matter. Um, what I propose to talk about is a study that I finished uh, just a couple of months ago uh, concerning the uh, prescription of uh, humility and forgiveness in workplaces. I'll explain or attempt to explain why I undertook that study um, and, and how I went about it and how it might help you. Uh, because I think it, the results of the study offer perhaps a very simple solution for some employers uh, to implement immediately without uh, cost or without uh, significant effort. The problem uh, that we all know of uh, is the fact that harassment and violence are on the rise in workplaces across Canada and frankly across the Western world. Jenny and Silky spoke uh, about this uh, earlier this afternoon. Uh, here are some of the statistics published um, by Western University in April of 2022. And, and we can see that uh, members of the gender diverse community are most impacted by harassment, sexual harassment and online harassment. But we can also see that um, uh, women and men are um, significantly impacted as well. Um, uh, those who are not members of the gender diverse uh, community. And so it's a concern across the board. We know too that, um, and the literature tells us this, that incivility, which is in some ways a precursor to harassment and violence, um, is an epidemic of its own. Um, uh, Christine Porath and Christine Pearson, who are prolific in the study of this uh, workplace incivility subject uh, have indicated that as many as 99% of uh, employees that they canvassed uh, in one study um, had witnessed incivility and about 10% of the workforce 
is witnessing incivility on a daily basis. So for me, the reason I care about this is that in my 30 years of practicing labor, employment, and human rights law, I have dealt almost exclusively with uh, workplace disputes that typically emerge from conflicts that arise in more innocuous ways than you might expect. Um, in fact, I, I anticipate that so many of you who are participating in today's conference understand this very well, but workplace conflicts that can lead to quitting, uh, that can lead to uh, sick leaves, disabilities, um, psychological uh, conditions, and uh, employment terminations. These are conflicts that often uh, germinate from simple incivility or personal harassment. And so for me as a lawyer, I, I suppose I could say, well, you know, that's part of life and that's what lawyers are for but uh but i think that's not an appropriate response and and instead i think um i should be interested in how we could resolve conflict how we could even um prevent certain forms of conflict i recognize that some forms of conflict are productive and uh, beneficial the ones that faster and remain unresolved are not. And those are the disputes that I deal with so often. It's heartbreaking, frankly, to see individuals and even organizations go through the consequence of unresolved conflict. Uh, it's, I think, devastating. So, so I uh, became interested in how we could, as a society, really attack the um, problem of un, unresolved workplace conflict. And um, Angela mentioned some of the research that I've done in that field of um, employee lawsuits, what motivates those lawsuits. This, um, this interest um, is just a continuation. And frankly, I, I started my thought process on this in uh, the sports realm. And I was interested to hear Jenny talk about um, the concept of her workforce as a team rather than as a family. Um, I agree with that. Uh, and I think that there are many valuable lessons that can be taken from the sports world in respect of leadership uh, in workplaces. And as a, as a sports coach, I, I, I was years ago studying quite intently a number of the most successful uh, sports coaches in the history of sports. So I, I looked at John Wooden, uh, the famous basketball coach uh, from UCLA in the 1970s, Vince Lombardi, uh, the Green Bay Packers NFL coach in the 60s, uh, and, um, and also um, Mel Davidson, the um, enormously successful uh, coach of Canada's uh, female Olympic hockey team. Uh, additionally, this guy, Bob Ladisor, who is less well known, but uh, eventually has been the source of uh, uh, the subject, sorry, of a, of a Hollywood movie. He, um, he was coaching high school football in Concord, California, just outside of Oakland. And, um, and at a small school, a De La Salle High School, not a not a large institution. When he when he started coaching, his team had never had a winning season. And um, what I found interesting about the guy, well before he became the subject of a movie, was that he had been able to lead this team of rotating high school students through. Um, 12 consecutive undefeated seasons uh, and a, a, a winning streak that was featured in Sports Illustrated magazine as the streak, um, the most uh, successful winning streak in U.S. amateur sports history. And I thought, here's somebody who has done something special 
in respect of leadership. So I studied him at a significant depth and uh, was able to draw out of his writing and his uh, video lectures, a few principles that I related back to this guy, uh, St. Benedict of Nursia, um, who in the 500s wrote the Benedictine rule, uh, which is a rule book for how monks uh, in St. Benedict's monastery would behave in order to get along with one another. And that's a very long um, rule. It's 73 chapters. But, um, but in uh, the Benedictine rule, there is heavy prescription of humility and forgiveness. And, and I noticed uh, humility and forgiveness embedded in Bob Latasur's uh, teachings as well. I also noticed it in John Wooden's teaching and Vince Lombardi's teaching and on and on. And I thought that's interesting because these are enormously successful organizational leaders who were all referencing humility and forgiveness. So I wondered then if there was some way that um, organizational leaders today could actually implement virtues of humility and forgiveness in their workplaces. Keep in mind, as we all know, our society today is not one that really uh, prescribes or subscribes to uh, humility and forgiveness in the ways that they once were taken on board. We're much more individualistic and we're much more um, egocentric. So I considered the research of Sridhari Desai, who is a professor at University of North Carolina and has taught in uh, the Harvard uh, Kennedy School. Sridhari Desai was looking at a similar question and wondering how she could help to moderate bad behavior in workplaces. And specifically, Sridhari Desai uh, wanted to consider the use of nudge theory. And some of you would be familiar with this concept uh, from Cass Sustein's uh, book on the subject. Nudge theory is that idea that through very subtle um, influences in, a, in an environment, we can uh, change the way people behave. I suppose we've seen this uh, and experienced it ourselves during the COVID pandemic with those arrows that appeared on every floor. And, you know, we all probably followed the arrows uh, without anyone telling us to do that because we were being nudged along by them. And so um, that's, uh, that's essentially the nudge theory that Shreed Harry Desai was uh, making use of. And what she did in, in a study was to um, simply, and this is so simple, I think, uh, she simply uh, displayed moral symbols in a number of workplaces. By moral symbols, I mean symbols that uh, most members of society would associate with um, high moral um, standards. Um, she displayed Buddha. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa, um, Rama, Jesus Christ, uh, images like that in workplaces, and then measured how those um, how those um, displays affected behavior in the workplace. And what she found was that simply displaying those those images actually improved. Uh, behaviors in workplaces. So then I wondered, well, all right, if that's the case, could we nudge, could you nudge your uh, colleagues in the workplace to exercise humility and forgiveness in a simple, easy manner? Um, what I did was first looked at uh, the definition of humility, and I chose this definition. Of course, the you know, the concept has a number of definitions, but 
it's sometimes misunderstood as being, you know, a form of weakness. It's not really that at all. It's instead a, you know, a form of open-mindedness and a willingness to understand both the strengths and limitations of an individual and to be able to, you know, see and, um, and um, tolerate um, ideas that may not equate with one's own ideas. I looked at the definition of forgiveness as well and, and chose this one. Um, some people complicate, I think, forgiveness with the question of whether an apology has to be issued by the wrongdoer first. I chose a definition where forgiveness is a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person or group uh, who has harmed you, regardless of whether they actually deserve uh, your forgiveness. Now, you might say, well, gee, Kelly, like, why would these things be important? I think they're important in a workplace because if we are able to um, escalate or increase the practice of humility and forgiveness in a workplace, there is a chance that individuals will be more capable of dealing with workplace conflicts and that, in fact, fewer workplace conflicts will arise. That, I think, has a very practical benefit for individuals and for organizations. All of you know that today we have a mounting um, number of workplace harassment investigations being undertaken across industries. And I've had the really good fortune of working with a number of large organizations, not only here in New Brunswick, but in Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, Ontario, and in uh, the United States on this subject of how, how an organization can implement uh, measures that will um, help their employees to, um, to coexist more peacefully and, uh, and to not um, fall into these conflicts that you know, are often so damaging. Um, on the screen, you'll see some results of a 2009 study about the causes of workplace conflict, and these may sound familiar to you. Um, first, warring egos and personality clashes, poor leadership, uh, lack of honesty, stress, and uh, clashing values. And it occurred to me that all of these are um, uh, precipitators of conflict that could be reduced um, by the practice of humility and then could be resolved if we had a greater capacity for uh, forgiveness. So um, the subject of humility should, I think, be of interest to every business person. Um, the literature on this is, is very solid. And uh, this um, quote that you see on the screen or summary on the screen uh, comes from research done by Mark Leary at Duke University. Uh, he's found that uh, individuals who have a high measure of intellectual humility are likely to be more accepting of others' beliefs. Remember back to that screen that I showed you in which um, clashing values are a significant um, cause of, of conflict in the workplace. Also, intellectual humility may reduce the risk of conflict regarding beliefs and ideology. Um, and then with regard to forgiveness, the, the literature tells us that uh, forgiveness has a, an enormous and incredible power. Um, in our society today, we are not um, perhaps um, well connected with forgiveness, but, but uh, forgiveness has been demonstrated to break cycles of rumination, to reduce stress, to increase emotional well-being, to improve cardiovascular health, uh, to reduce anxiety and depression, and to decrease the frequency of risky behaviors such as alcoholism and other forms of addictive uh, behaviors. So where, it is, where do the concepts of humility and forgiveness come from? That was a question that I had 
uh, at the outset of my research. Um, there are a few answers to this. In Western culture, um, experts indicate that these, um, you know, these concepts did not exist uh, in ancient Greece or in ancient Rome. Um, ancient Rome had a concept of clemency, which is different from forgiveness, but neither the ancient Greeks nor the ancient Ro Romans really viewed humility uh, or forgiveness as virtues. Uh, instead, they saw them as weaknesses. Um, it was, it turns out the in Western culture, the Jews um, and and then the the early Christians, first century Christians who who wrote about humility and forgiveness and um, and even uh, Jonathan Haidt, uh, an an atheist uh, um, academic at New York University, um, suggests that these values were embedded in um, Western culture uh, through the first century uh, by the early uh, Judeo-Christian um, value system. So, so then I thought, okay, well, following with Sridhari Desai's um, research, what happens if we attach um, that foundation to uh, you know, humility and forgiveness in a study? What I did is I wrote three short workplace policies, each one of which referenced the concepts of humility and forgiveness. And I'll ask you just to notice the colors here because these become important when I show you the results of the data uh, collected. The blue policy uh, was one that referenced the definitions of humility and forgiveness that I showed you earlier. But the blue policy really didn't encourage uh, the organization members to practice humility or forgiveness. It just it just acknowledged them as as uh, concepts. The green policy, which was given to some participants in my study, uh, not only referenced the definitions of humility and forgiveness, but it spoke of them as having um, biblical foundations. And it also prescribed or encouraged members of an organization to practice um, humility and forgiveness. And then the third uh, policy, the orange one, uh, defined humility and forgiveness like the other two, but it made no reference to biblical foundations. Um, it did, however, encourage members of the orange organization to practice humility and forgiveness. And this is where I think the study might be of some interest or use to you. Um, the study involved in recruiting some participants. Uh, you'll see in a minute that there were 59 participants. And I, um, I had the participants join a Zoom call. Um, they were divided into three groups. One was assigned to the blue policy, one to the green, and a third group to the orange policy. They were each given five minutes to read their policy. And then they were brought back together into uh, a main Zoom call. They were told that they were participating in an organizational meeting of a not-for-profit uh, organization that they had joined. And the meeting was for the purpose of discussing a future fundraising project that would be conducted by the not-for-profit organization. Um, I had uh, created a short reader's theater script. Some of you know that I'm a proponent of reader's theater as a training mechanism. This is another possibility for all of you, a, a concrete training tool that you could consider. And in, the, in my study, um, the reader's theater script um, laid out the concept of a, an organizational meeting to discuss this fictional fundraising project. In the uh, script, one of the participants um, was playing the chairman of the meeting. 
a second uh, participant was the head of the fundraising committee, and a third participant was uh, a person, a member of the organization who was willing to offer an idea uh, for the future fundraising project. The third person, the, the person offering the idea, ended up being belittled and demeaned by the um, fundraising chair. Uh, the fundraising chair told this third person in no uncertain terms that her idea was stupid and uh, really was not creative and a waste of everyone's time. Um, the participants in the, in the experiment had to watch this meeting unfold. And at the end of the meeting, they were then uh, directed to a questionnaire um, about their um, perspectives on the meeting and how they would respond to the behavior that they just saw in light of their assigned policy. So there were 59 participants, as I mentioned, uh, they were divided into three groups. Each one read one of the three color-coded policies. They then participated in the reader's theater exercise I described, and then responded to uh, questions on an electronic questionnaire. And so here are some of the results that you may find interesting and that may be transferable to your organization. First, I asked the participants at the end of the experiment uh, if humility should be encouraged in their organization with respect to response to organizational conflict. The blue group um, had 63% of the members uh, say yes. The orange group had 89% say yes, and the green group, that's the group that referenced uh, the biblical foundations, only 50% said yes. What I think might be useful to you is to look at that uh, orange result. Um, remember, it was very simple, a policy that defined humility and forgiveness uh, as virtues and stated that the orange organization subscribed to those uh, those virtues. With regard to forgiveness, um, it was found that slightly fewer uh, members, but still a majority, uh, were willing to uh, exercise forgiveness and felt that it should be encouraged. Um, in the case of the orange group, 72% of the members said, yes, forgiveness should be encouraged. In the case of the blue group, it was 63%. And finally, bringing up the rear, the green group at 44%. So now, um, a further question. Did these experiment participants agree with the contents of their policies? Remember, the policies said, here's what humility is, here's what uh, forgiveness is. In the case of the um, orange group, uh, the policy went further to say, and our orange organization expects you as a member to, to uh, exercise humility and forgiveness. In the case of the green group, the policy went even further still to say, um, we expect you to exercise humility and forgiveness. And we point out that these are uh, rooted in the Bible. Um, the members of the orange group uh, said very overwhelmingly that they agreed with the contents of their policy. Uh, so too uh, was the case with the blue group and 50% of the members of the green group said, yes, we agree. Now look at these stats. If you were a member of the organization in real life, would you be willing to follow the organizational policy? Again, in the orange group, 89% said, yes, I will exercise humility and forgiveness. Um, slightly, uh, slightly lower than that, the blue group at 85%, and then the green group at 63%. Now, here's another uh, outcome that I thought was interesting. After having read the value statement contained in your organization's policy, were you more inclined to exercise humility and forgiveness as defined in the policy um, in this scenario than you would have been before reading it? In other words, uh, you know, this is a post then pre um, 
measurement, uh, did the participants in the experiment find that they were influenced uh, in their thinking about the, the conflict uh, by their policies? Um, in the uh, in the blue group, sixty percent said yes. Um, we, you know, our behavior or our thought process about the uh, scenario changed as a result of reading the policy. Fifty six percent in the orange group said yes, and interestingly and curiously, sixty six percent in the green group said yes. Um, what it tells us is that sixty one percent of all the members on average um, felt that their policies would influence their um, thinking about the conflict that they had seen. Another outcome that I wanted to measure was what did people think about Reader's Theater? Uh, some of you uh, know Sue O'Donnell, Dr. Sue O'Donnell at the UMB School of Nursing, and she is a um, um, a really prolific and, and important researcher in the subject of workplace harassment. Uh, she and I have worked with uh, Dr. Anil Adeshesh on Reader's Theatre projects in the past, and we feel it's a compelling training method for employers. We, I wanted to see what uh, these uh, experiment participants thought of it. 61% thought that the uh, reader's theater uh, format was significantly more effective than a lecture format or reading the scenario on one's own. And another 8% um, thought it was somewhat more effective. So my takeaway from this is that um, you as an organizational leader might find reader's theater to be helpful uh, in conveying um, these um, important training issues to your, your workforce. And, and that's not just in respect of humility. Um, Dr. O'Donnell and Dr. Adeshesh and I do um, reader's theater exercises uh, with regard to workplace harassment generally. So what are some conclusions that you could extrapolate from this experiment? Um, first, I think we can safely assume that workplace conflict is not going away, at least not anytime soon. And so as leaders and organizations, we do have to think about how we can moderate um, uh, the occurrence of conflict and, and the duration of it. Um, we can understand too that unresolved conflict generally has negative effects on individual workers and whole organizations. We I would assert that humility and forgiveness are virtues that have been overlooked uh, in contemporary society. And I think that the uh, experiment that I've done supports other literature to the effect that humility and forgiveness can help you improve your employees' conflict management competencies. Um, and, and, and you can do it in such an easy, um, an easy way. Uh, you can prescribe these in your respectful workplace policy and then uh, provide training. So that's what I wanted to put forward as, as um, some ideas that might be of use to some of you. I hope, I hope those are of use to some of you. I really think that if you're interested in being able to um, improve workplace behavior in your organization, it is worthwhile thinking carefully about um, the prescription of intellectual humility. Intellectual humility is very difficult for anyone to argue against, um, but what it does as a, as a virtue is it encourages organizational members to be more tolerant, um, to be more accepting, uh, to question uh, more as opposed to uh, making uh, statements and to be more open to feedback. And on that point, I was thinking just before we started that um, Doug Heen, or sorry, Doug uh, Stone and Sheila Heen at Harvard University wrote uh, this book, Thanks for the Feedback, that you might be familiar with. Um, uh, the book speaks to this subject of how we take on feedback. 
Um, in my work as a lawyer, I very frequently encounter situations where employees um, have interpreted a manager's feedback as harassment. Um, because obviously a, a manager has to, in some instances, say to an employee something that is less than positive um, about uh, that employee's behavior or job performance. And in the way that um, we've developed as a society, again, Jonathan Haidt uh, writes about this uh, and wrote a very famous article in the Atlantic magazine about this. Uh, you know, we have whole generations of people who have grown up with very little, um, very little practice accepting um, feedback that is less than positive. And, um, and so one way to address that, that shortfall um, is, is through the prescription of humility. I will tell you that forgiveness is a harder topic. Um, partly because, um, again, in our society, we, we have a very rights-based society. And so um, you will encounter some people who are opposed to the practice of forgiveness um, or even the mention of forgiveness because um, they see it as somehow letting uh, the perpetrator of a, an offense off the hook. Um, it's important to understand what forgiveness really is. Uh, it doesn't have to do with the perpetrator as much as it does the person who is extending the forgiveness. And I think that as I demonstrated uh, on an earlier slide, uh, forgiveness has been shown to massively improve the well-being of um, yeah, people who have, who have been subjected to offenses. So I'm hoping that those ideas might be of some use to you. It's 20 minutes to three. Uh, I know that I'm supposed to end at 2.55. Um, I wonder if anyone has any questions. I'll look in the Q&A. Sure. There, there is a question that's come in already, uh, Kelly, and thank you for your presentation. Um, so how do you train people in intellectual humility, which you just mentioned? Right. I think uh, that's a great question. First, I think um, there has to be uh, a definition provided. Second, I think in, especially in most uh, work uh, environments, um, it will be important to provide some literature that uh, supports the value of intellectual humility. Third, I think that um, in my experience, at least, uh, employees are quite willing to discuss the subject of intellectual humility. And, and um, having done these exercises with uh, office workers in Toronto, with agricultural workers in Prince Edward Island, with um, uh, an international law firm in New York City, uh, it, everybody, it turns out, is very similar in their, in their approach to the subject matter. And what I've experienced is that people... Um, are quite receptive to talking about um, humility. Um, some will be very quiet in the course of the discussion. Um, that's usually an indication that they're struggling uh, with, uh, with the concept. But, but when you present it as a defined term, um, when you make some um, reference to the literature that supports its uh, its validity and its use in organizations, um, that seems to open um, a willingness to discuss it for most people. And then what I've suggested is that um, a reader's theater uh, scripts can actually help people um, with, a, with a felt experience that they are comfortable discussing because it's a third party uh, experience. Um, in the experiment that I conducted, um, you know, people were quite willing to um, express their thoughts about um, the behavior uh, in the written questionnaire that they completed after the fact. And I've seen that in groups uh, many, many times. So, so I think that you can teach it. Um, 
in a in a very simple uh, four step uh, four step approach. Um, and there's another question uh, as well uh, about if one is not inclined to humility and forgiveness, how can one grow in that sense? Um, I think that's such a such a valuable observation because I can say that many people find it difficult to talk about forgiveness, particularly uh, in the study that I conducted, and I didn't present these uh, data points to you, but uh, a number of uh, participants from all walks of life, um, I was fortunate to have participants from a variety of countries, um, from a variety of uh, um, professions and occupations, and also a variety of uh, belief systems. Um, across the board, people struggled with uh, the idea of forgiveness initially. Um, and that's partly because they confuse it with apology um, and they conflate it with um, you know, whether an apology has to be provided by the wrongdoer first. They also point to the fact that um, there is not a bright line in their, in their view uh, between uh, behaviors that can be forgiven and the behaviors, uh, sorry, and behaviors that they can't really forgive. Um, I think that the experts in forgiveness would say that it, irrespective of the wrongdoing, the act of forgiveness is um, a beneficial and sort of cleansing um, exercise for the victim. That's a hard thing for us to communicate to people because, um, you know, because our society really focuses on rights and we focus on retribution, um, perhaps more now than than uh, ever in my lifetime. Last uh, last summer, uh, some of you might remember the story of a young man in St. John who. Um, ended up punching a 55-year-old man uh, on the boardwalk outside of Market Square. Um, he punched the fellow and killed him. And, um, and he went to trial, as you might imagine. What struck me about that story, this is something you can look up if you're interested, but the family of that victim, the family of the dead uh, victim, um, publicly forgave the young man. And I think um, it, that to me was a, such a, uh, a demonstration of how forgiveness can, you know, free, free us from all of these negative feelings. Another story that strikes me is um, a woman in British Columbia who, and you might know this story, but years ago, um, her next door neighbor went away. The, the two parents uh, uh, next door went away for the weekend and the teenage son had a party uh, in their house. And at about two or three in the morning, this woman's husband got up out of bed and went next door to ask the teenagers that they turn down the music. Um, when he went to the door, um, he was... Uh, beaten to death by two teenagers at the party. And, you know, it's a horrific, horrific story. Um, the woman ultimately forgave, um, you know, forgave these uh, two, two teenagers and has told the story many times now um, on a TED Talk and elsewhere. She talks about how the forgiveness of of the two perpetrators really freed her of so many you know so many um emotions that were eating her um so we have to you know we have to question whether that might be of benefit to, to others um right and there's some there are some really good comments um Isabel Belanger Brown um, 
um, uh, talking about the effect of forgiveness. If you're interested in this, by the way, I'm I'm bringing the forgiveness project to St. John again. I, I did it five years ago and I just made the arrangements to bring it to St. John again from the United Kingdom. Um, not because I'm an expert in forgiveness or that I understand it, uh, but just because I think I could benefit and maybe you could uh, too. And so I think in the workplace, by the way, this can be done. This this is something that we can all um, encourage our coworkers to consider. And you as an organizational leader can, can do it so simply by uh, just plunking those definitions into your policy and making a one-line statement that your organization subscribes to humility and forgiveness. I'll give you this caution though. Once you do that, your leadership has to, you must, um, you must do it. Uh, you can't as leaders um, prescribe humility and forgiveness and then not exercise them yourself. So it's 2.47. I don't know if there are any other questions or any other way that I could um, uh, be of interest. If, if I'm right, uh, a number of you stayed on the line, which I so appreciate, <laughs> but I'd be interested, by the way, in your feedback on this research. Um, I really would be because uh, it's part of a larger study that I'm, that I'm engaged in now. And so whenever someone like you who has an interest in the subject, takes the time to email me about it, I'm able to usually get a perspective that I didn't have before. So um, if you're willing to email me, I'd, I'd really love to hear from you. Type my email into the box here. Thanks so much, Kelly. So it sounds as though um, Kelly's gonna put his contact information um, in the chat. Uh, so for anyone that's willing to reach out and um, provide feedback um, with respect to um, what was shared today around humility and forgiveness and how that can contribute it, contribute to a uh, more respectful and positive workplace environments. And uh, really, I, I liked how you spoke about them as, as competencies that maybe folks aren't considering, but could be considered in terms of supporting um, conflict management or resolution in the workplace. So thank you for that, Kelly. And on behalf of the Workplace Violence and Abuse Research Team, um, we appreciate uh, your return visits. This is not your first visit. Anyone may have, uh, some folks might remember Kelly from uh, Reader's Theater, um, which was offered, I think, uh, this spring, but also at a previous Respectful Workplace Week. And so this is our 10th annual Respectful Workplace Week. So thanks for coming back, Kelly. We appreciate you coming. Thank you, Angela. Thanks. Kelly, there's still time. I noticed there is another question that's come in. So if you have time to answer it, if you wanted to answer it aloud, feel free, whatever works best for you. Oh, sure. Thanks. Um, first, um, everyone, what I'm typing in and I'll finish typing, um, some of the experts on forgiveness, particularly uh, Everett Worthington Jr. Um, taught at uh, Virginia uh, Dominion Commonwealth, no, Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, he's an expert in forgiveness, partly because he became interested. He's a psychologist. He became interested when his when his mother was murdered um, and uh, he ended up uh, exercising forgiveness toward the uh, murderer. Um, there's uh, Joshua Hook and Don Davis at uh, Georgia State University. Um, all of uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu's books speak to this. Um, in, in the context of forgiveness related to the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I'm going to point out, too, that um, the Archbishop of Canterbury has a new program. And, and again, this is not a like a religious thing. It's just he does it in a very secular way, really. But um, he talks about um, uh, the power of humility and forgiveness in um, in conflict resolution. And so I'll I'll just type that into the box as well. There's a question here. Um, uh, could you suggest phases um, or approaches that can be used to help facilitate um, uh, humility? Um, and, and right, 
I think that um, I think that organically, what seems to happen. Please remember, uh, if if you go back to my comments about those sports coaches, um, there's uh, that I that I had studied years ago. Um, they would have very uh, clear and uh, demonstrative practices of humility. For example, John Wooden, the famous basketball coach. I have two minutes, so I'll just I'll tell you this. John Wooden, the famous basketball coach, would have all of these uh, recruited basketball players show up at UCLA, and they would be the star players from around the United States. So you know, people who understood that they were good basketball players. And in his first practice in the gym at UCLA, John Wooden would teach these players how to put their socks on properly. Um, now you think about that, that sounds like such a silly thing. These were young players who were putting socks on all the time. He would make them sit on the floor and he would teach them how to put their socks on properly. Why not? because they needed to be taught how to put socks on, but because they needed to be taught that they could learn something uh, in a different way uh, from what they were used to doing. Um, similarly, Bob Latisseur, the coach at De La Salle High School, before each game, the night before each game, he would have his players gather together and th they had a, a tradition that one player would write out a promise card um, to another player. And in the card, he the player would say, I promise that tomorrow I'm going to do my best in blocking, or I'm going to, you know, do my best to catch three passes, or whatever the case would be. And he would give the card to another player. Um, all of those things illustrate a commitment to the organization, to the, to the team members. Um, and Jenny spoke about you know, her team members um, at the 11th Mile Restaurant. Well, those are the kinds of exercise that, that seem to be really successful in facilitating humility. So I just throw those out as well.